Okay, uh, let, let, let us start a, a bit. I think, I, and I hope more people are going to join uh, uh, this evening. So welcome uh, to you all. My name is René Terhoeven. I'm one of the board members of the Agile Consortium. Uh, maybe not everybody here is, uh, is familiar with the Agile Consortium. Uh, we are a non-profit organization based in the Netherlands, in Belgium, and now starting up in Italy. Um, and we have uh, only one thing we want to do, and that is to spread the, the knowledge and, um, and, uh, and skills and wisdom uh, of agility. Uh, so that, do, that is something we do with, uh, with talks like this. Also, we have uh, one every year an annual conference in the Netherlands. We have also an annual conference in Belgium. Um, and next to that, we also do uh, vendor-dependent, framework-independent uh, certifications. So if you are interested in that, uh, please go to our website, uh, agileconsortium.nl, uh, there you'll find more information. Uh, but I uh, will not uh, keep you all um, um, waiting for Michael. So welcome, Michael. Michael Spade, uh, uh, I found uh, 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 able and willing to, to do a talk uh, for us. Uh, so Michael, you, I think, will be talking for approximately 90, 90 minutes. And after that, if everybody still want to, there is, of course, uh, uh, room for uh, all kinds of questions and answers. Mm. Uh, I will also keep an eye on the chat. Uh, so uh, as we agreed, Michael, as I, if I see things that, uh, that we need to discuss mm. right away, I will, uh, I will uh, ask uh, you to, to do so. And otherwise, uh, we uh, go uh, through the other questions in the chat uh, after the talk. Like you see, this talk is being recorded. We will place uh, the recording uh, on, uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you don't want to be uh, recorded, uh, then uh, please share down your camera. On the other hand, Michael looks also, wants also to look us a little bit in the eye, um, if that's possible with Zoom. But uh, then we can, uh, at least Michael can have some feedback uh, while he is doing his talk. Uh, so, Yes, if it's possible, please keep your cameras on. Uh, if you don't want to be recorded, then uh, please uh, put it off. So, Michael, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Renee. Thank you for the invitation. So, um, since we have a, a, a small group, um, let's, uh, let's have a little more interaction. I, I, I won't be speaking straight for 90 minutes. It'll be um, more an interactive flow, depending on... Um, it's it's usually it's not useful at the beginning usually to have lots of questions because I raise provocative issues that might be you might want to explore and until I lay a certain groundwork it's usually not helpful to go too much into it because I'm going to cover that in the in the framework if that makes sense but let me just get a sense of, of you um, how about maybe three people share why did you come tonight. To this talk what what inspired you or motivated you to do that i can maybe share a, uh, a bit on that but uh yeah. um, i'm an agile coach at uh, ing um, uh, one of the uh, bigger dutch banks uh, i see some colleagues also joining here um, and um, I think frequently uh, uh, attending sessions like this is, is a good way of getting outside in perspective on the things that we're, we're doing um, in our uh, uh, organizational transformation. Um, one of the areas I like to focus on is the, is the, the part of the, the non-delivery part of ING, the, the risk departments, the finance departments, um, and what agility actually means to people working in those areas and how we can bring it together. Um, I hope I can uh, use the insights in this session to also make a step there. Okay, Great. thank you. How about somebody else? <clears throat> Just a bottom line, what piqued your interest? Your boss told you you had to be here. Um, you uh, paid can't, by the hour, can't, maybe? Can't, re can't resist the free refreshments? No. It's a little bit different for me, uh, Michael. Uh, when, I, when I read the announcement of your talk, uh, it said something about, you know, 
being frustrated with the organization. Yeah. And, you know, that is uh, only something for myself as an agile coach I, I recognize from time to time. Yeah, and actually, sure. I felt that creeping up to me. So I thought, oh, it would be a good session yeah. to, uh, to deal with it once more. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, how about one more person, maybe a woman? Voice would be good. Yeah, I, I can add on that, that I uh, sometimes feel a little frustrated that it's hard to get a change work and get, get yeah. it flow. Yeah. Uh, so I really would like to get some inspiration. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, great. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate having that little bit of context. Um, so let me uh, start sharing the uh, slides and So this is called, is an enterprise transformation even possible? Um, <clears throat> this is um, me and my book, Agile Transformation, using the integral Agile Transformation framework to think and lead differently, uh, co-authored with Michelle Medor. Um, and this is my uh, business partner, Michael Hammond, uh, who wrote a book called Evolve Agility. And uh, we have a enterprise coach training program um, that uh, we've gotten really excited about. Michael and I were, <clears throat> Michael and I worked together for um, a number of years at, at ACI and, uh, and then we had a, a hiatus for a couple of years and um, then we got back together and uh, we're having a really good time together. Um, <clears throat> the, a little bit about my background, if you don't, if you're not familiar with it, I'm the, uh, I started in Agile in, in um, uh, actually literally 20 years ago um, with a really large implementation of uh, uh, extreme programming in a, in a telecom, in a totally not what you would expect, you know, a very traditional dyed in the wool, you know, bureaucratic phone company um, in 2001 doing XP across hundreds and hundreds of teams, across 50,000 employees, 5,000 in IT. It was insane to do that. It was, it truly was totally insane to do that. Um, but the chaos, the resulting chaos taught me a lot about, um, you know, how Agile works in some environments and, and, and with some teams and doesn't in others. It, it, it was, it was a huge experiment, you know, uh, well, lots of failures. Um, you know, they, you know, they had, uh, they, we gave them uh, uh, intensive immersion, really good training actually for four or five days, but then no other coaching support. And so they were just on their own. Um, and out of that, because I had a background in, in organization development and psychology and in, uh, at the time, not in professional coaching, but but soon after in, in professional coaching and facilitation, um, I recognized early on the need for outside disciplines in the agile coaching world. So because I had studied many of these things, I started uh, sort of systematically bringing them into agile conferences. Um, Starting in 2003, actually, I brought in organizational change management in 2003 into the first big uh, uh, Agile conference in Salt Lake City. Um, and did transformations uh, throughout the 2000s. And uh, in, in 2010, I co-founded the Agile Coaching Institute with Lisa Atkins, um, who... <coughs> You know, I had I had turned her on to the idea of professional coaching in the first place, and and had seeded this idea of the Agile Coaching Institute. And so she, uh, when her book was going to be published, Coaching Agile Teams, she wanted me to help her run this uh, uh, business together. Um, and, and we developed a uh, Agile Coach competency model that that. You might not know that we developed that, but um, but most of you have been exposed to that. The uh, teaching, uh, mentoring, uh, facilitation, professional coaching, transformation mastery, technical mastery, uh, uh, 
uh, business mastery. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so I want to say about that. Um, and I, I've been, well, so, so I, I have taught literally thousands of uh, agile coaches all around the world um, for the last 10 years. And the, and I was, I had, I had started writing this book in 2012 was when I got under book contract. Um, and uh, it was called Coaching the Agile Enterprise at the time because it was sort of, sort of rhymed with Lisa's book title, Coaching Agile Teams. And it was, it was a response in a large, lot of ways to the frustrations that I saw, speaking of frustrations of Agile coaches, the frustrations I saw of Agile coaches in training lots of them, and um, <clears throat> the ways that they were not, they didn't have the tools to really be skillful with what was going on in their environments and the mismatch between the Agile they were envisioning and that they'd been taught and they wanted and the, and the organizations that they were, you know, putting that Agile into. It did, didn't line up. And, and uh, really creating the integral Agile transformation framework for me was about, um, you know, the Hippocratic oath that, that, that doctors take um, is first, do no harm. And I saw agile coaches doing harm um, because they were so frustrated and they had been given a change charge on the one hand and they were unable to do it. So um, uh, <clears throat> I've been working with this concept for a long time, you know, to try to um, help people be realistic about what they could actually do um, in a in a given organizational environment. So this talk is going to sort of summarize uh, that. The first place we're going to look is a uh, what I call a culture code mismatch between agile and between most organizations. So let's so if you if you know Frederick Lalu, um, you know some of this work. Um, whoops. Uh, a point of clarification: I've done a lot of research in this area and. The real founder of this work is a man named Claire Graves, um, who was a psychologist uh, who was a contemporary of Abraham Maslow and uh, did research in the 1970s and 1980s and um, discovered that there were different um, styles of being a person. He, he had uh, students for um, he had it for several years, many of them, and he was researching how do they, what do they think a mature person is? What do they value? And he didn't go in with any kind of a theory. He didn't have any idea. He just uh, said he had people write conceptions of what they thought um, a mature person did or what they were like, what they valued. And he found that there was different there was about four or five different types and um, that independent judges who didn't have any theory or anything when asked, can you put these into groupings of which are similar, these are similar, and these are similar, and these are similar, you know, could they do that? And could they agree? And he found a, um, a, 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 a really insane level of consistency amongst judges. What, what you find with expert judges when you do work like that is that they don't agree. Um, that's part of why they're expert is because they have their own whatever. Um, and these people all agreed on the categories. They didn't agree on a name for them or what it meant or anything else, but just these are similar and these are similar and these are similar. And then when he, when he uh, went, went back and looked at that research, he did lots of different kind of analyses on, on that data and found that people were always either centered in one level about 60%, or they were moving between one level and the next level up, about 40%. They were not all over the place. They didn't go randomly. They went in sequence. And that's a consistent finding in all developmental psychology really is that people go in sequences um, when uh, moving through a stage model. This is a, a diagram drawn by Peter Green. It's, 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 
It's an encapsulation of Frederick Lalo's work. So Frederick Lalo took Claire Graves' work, which was also um, expressed in a book called Spiral Dynamics by Don Beck and Chris Cowan. Don Beck was, was Claire Graves' student. And Frederick Lalu then in the 2000s took it to the next level with organizations specifically and looking at how different organizations, especially teal organizations, people on the cutting edge of organizations, how they work. So this is just an encapsulation um, of some of the key, like uh, here you'll see innovation, accountability, meritocracy. Those are the three innovations of level five culture. So level four, five, six, and seven. And I'll, I'll, go, I'll talk about that a little bit, what they're like. And, and look for where is the resonance with, um, with agile values? Where do agile values start to actually align or make sense? Or, you know, if you were, if you were gonna match agile values to one of these culture codes, which would you match it to is sort of the question. So um, in, a, in a level four, conformist Amber, um, people value certainty and order. They like things to be predictable. They like things to be done. You have executives that demand predictability from you all the time. Estimates have to be right or you know, whatever it is. Um, and, and they also value uh, honor and, and doing their duty. It's a, it's, a, it's a meme that particularly <clears throat> comes out in the, uh, the military often, classically. Uh, the mindset is I'll be safe if I follow the rules. I'm following the, rule, the rules of experts and they know what they're doing and I can trust that. And I conform to group expectations and the, uh, I'm, I, I have a long-term perspective and the consistent processes allows us to be, to have stability organizationally. So for how many of you does that seem like it's consistent with Agile values? Would that be a match you'd make? Just give me a yes or no. Yes, I can't see your hand. It's in the wrong. Uh, uh, okay. Great, thanks. So let's go to level five, Achievement Orange. Culture code level five. So in contrast, they uh, level five values freedom and the ability to have an opportunity and to be successful, not by following rules, but by sometimes, but sort of breaking the rules or, or at least bending the rules. Um, uh, they value political power. Um, the mindset is I, I need to stand out in the, in, in, Level four, the mindset is the opposite. I, I need to not stand out. I need to conform to my role. Here is I need to stand out. Um, and business is not personal. And my, how I'm validated is I have success in achieving the goals within the game that I'm playing. And it's and it's it, it's a it's a finite game. It's not an infinite game. In a finite game, there are winners and losers. And and the object is to win. In an infinite game. Uh, uh, their, the object is to continue to play and to enjoy the play of the game. So here we're playing a, a, a finite game where we're trying to win. And, a, and a, you know, this culture code created innovation and accountability and, you know, uh, being uh, having a, what's called a meritocracy where you, you, uh, you move up because you're, because you're good, not because you've been there a long time necessarily, but because you're skillful, right? Okay, so how about, how about this? Does this seem like it's, it's uh, consistent with Agile values or to what extent? Any thoughts? Can't answer that with just a thumb. Um, it's better than the previous one, but uh, not fully in line with uh, what I would consider to be Agile. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, it's moving in the right direction um, and it's not Agile values. So, okay, so culture code six, pluralistic green. So see how the values are different. Fairness, equality of everybody of all, and of all perspectives and valuing relationship over outcomes. Uh, the mindset is to stay in relationship. 
We want to hear from everybody and we decide by consensus. Level, level five would decide by voting or by the leader. Level six decides by consensus. Um, I, I get validated by um, feeling heard and it's creating a safe space and, and having diversity. So how is this? Is this sounding uh, more agile or what would you say about this one? More agile. It's, it's quite consistent with agile uh, as, as practiced by most teams that I have come across. I think there's that that was more true, um, you know, back in the mm, around the, the change of decade uh, 2010. Um, you know, it was well, agile was pretty mainstream by then, but I think now it's uh, if you know Jeffrey Moore's technology adoption curve. Um, you're into the, the late majority and even the laggards are implementing Agile now and they, they're not doing it well because they're not, they're not cutting edge enough to, to be able to do it well. Um, so you have, you have a different kind of a thing happening, I believe now. I'm, I'm not a team coach right now. So, uh, okay, let's go into the last one now, level seven. So here we value authenticity um, autonomy to express ourselves, and most of all, fulfilling our purpose. Um, we get validation from having an inner sense of rightness about things, maybe in line with the data, but maybe in line with our gut and our intuition. We see systemically and don't identify with our ego. Now that's completely different than the other levels. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we uh, look to a wisdom beyond rationality. And in, at, the, at the end of the day, this level, this way of thinking out innovates orange. Level five. So how does this sound? Does this sound like agile to you? I have troubles imagining what what this really uh looks like so uh -huh. also hard well, to answer yes this is hard to imagine what it looks like because there's very few corporations and, and most likely you don't work for one that's that's teal uh, michael there was also a question uh, what about the levels one two three because you skipped them or are right. they so uh so a, a level three organization is an illegal organization it, it would be, it, it's typically a gang. I mean, seriously, it's a gang or it's a, a, a mafiosa, um, certain former U.S. presidents. Um, <clears throat> and level two is not, you, you, you wouldn't have an organization. It's too, so they're earlier times developmentally, but they're not realistic. They're, they're not, they're not applicable to organizations even though some people certainly are in those places. Okay, so, all right, so that's all interesting. That's a, that's a little bit of a, a overlay or background for where we're gonna go. Um, so let's talk about, uh, how many people have been exposed to Integral before? Anybody? Okay, so Integral is a, um, is a a worldwide philosophy and sort of application methodology. It was invented by a man named Ken Wilbur, who's an American philosopher. And um, he, uh, Ken is the, um, about the, well, probably the most well-read person I've ever met. Um, he has a tr he has a tremendous appetite and ability to absorb different kind of systems. And he, he has a, a really skillful ability to, to see the essence of different kind of systems. And his premise was that um, in studying world wisdom traditions of various kinds in, in all fields, I mean, you know, for re religion and spirituality, but also in medicine and psychology and business and leadership and art and uh, 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 social critique. His premise was that no school of thought that developed in human history 
um, could be um, wrong a hundred percent. That instead, that that he his premise was that everything has truth in it, but it's only partial. So, what's a system that we could use that would help us see that that uh, partial perspective, but also uh, uh, the the truth of it? So, um, so the first move is uh, is the four fundamental perspectives of the quadrants, which. The upper left, the uh, uh, upper right, the lower right, and the lower left, or we call them because they're associated with uh, whether they're a first person methodology or a second person methodology or a third person methodology. And um, that's uh, this is the upper left is I, the lower left is we, the upper right is it, and the lower right is its. So you could also say that the right-hand side is the tangible perspective, like things that are tangible, like that uh, are visible or measurable directly or whatever. And the left-hand sides are the intangible things, feelings and thoughts and uh, uh, emotions and thinking patterns. And so, and the, the top half is the singular version or a, an isolated instance of something. And the bottom is the collective version of something. So that's got that's got a lot of power. Every um, every uh, uh, consultant knows that you have to have a two by two matrix, right? And here is the integral two by two matrix. The, it corresponds to you know people um, in in uh, you know big four consulting organizations um, have have some kind of similar thing like this, but it's not as elegant of a model. So for instance, people will have the three or four big areas, people, culture, technology, right? Or um, practice, process, um, uh, technology, people, um, you know, something. Some kind of variation like that, right? So this has something like that, but it's based on a very deep methodology. It's based on the, the, um, the inherent wisdom and uh, uh, truth expressed by all human languages having first, second, and third person. So there's something to that that's built into our uh, archaeology, our, our uh, um, that's not the right word I want, um, our mechanisms, our structures as people has a first, second, and third person structure to it. So it understands those different perspectives. Okay, so let's look at that in, in this context. So. Um, uh, now we're getting into specifically the integral agile transformation framework, not just uh, integral in general. So in, in the it quadrant, in the practices and behavior quadrant, we pay attention to business results. That's what we focus on. That's what we see. I, I like to explain it like it's like a, a, an FM radio tuner that when you tune into to it FM, you see certain things, right? You see... Um, metrics and practices and the physical environment and you and you focus on business results that's the kind of things you see if you look with the it fm lens on if you will if, if you if you tune into the it fm frequency those are important things can't argue with those those are all you know things that we pay attention to when we're doing an agile transformation um and and uh most, uh, the focus of most transformation efforts is on this quadrant, you know, that's why people uh, always talk about it and focus on practices. And it's why they focus on training. Because training can teach practices, training can teach the things that are relevant in this quadrant. Um, but they don't tend to teach the other ones. Okay, so if we if we look now to shift to the organizational architect, what I call the organizational architecture window, <clears throat> um, we're we're looking at now the flow of value. So think about that: the business results versus the flow of value. Those are not the same thing. They're related to each other, but they're not the same thing. The flow of value has to do with like workflows and like could, could we visualize where the work goes from one stage to the other, from one person's queue to the other, how long does it stay in those queues, 
you know, what's the what's the lead time, what's the cycle time. We can measure all those things, right? That's why it's on the, the, the right-hand quadrant things. The things that we're, the, the objects, quote unquote, that we see from this quadrant's point of view are systems and org charts and workflows and governance structures and policies. Again, all really important things and um, specifically, uh, well, I call, I call the right-hand side outer agility. Th those are, you know, these are the things that organizations particularly like to focus on because they make more sense to them within their value structure, which is because most um, people in organizations are living a level five value structure. And so they like the concrete, tangible perspectives. It makes sense to them. Um, this is also the it's the lower uh, uh, right is where scaled frameworks focus, which is why they became so popular because Scrum only dealt with the practices essentially and a few things about um, a certain kind of mindset, right? It didn't, it didn't address anything, uh, you know, governance, conception, funding, um, the uh, instantiation process. It was a big, you know, it was strategically smart at a certain level and it was a big miss from a different point of view. And so that created a vacuum when, when Agile started to go into bigger organizations, they wanted somebody to address this, you know, structure, their organizational architecture, their roles, their existing people, their governance process and safe, for instance, and other scale frameworks, but especially safe plugged into that need, right? Because it addresses that stuff in a uh, arguably uh, agile kind of a way. Okay, so let's shift to the to the other side. Let's shift to um, the culture window. So here we're looking at a totally different thing. We're not looking at business results or flow. We're looking at the cultural resilience and the cultural alignment with what we're trying to do, like with agile values, for instance, you know, with uh, 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 focusing on customers, you know, creating great products, empowering teams. And um, we see different kinds of things. We see, or, or quote unquote, see, we, we, uh, they're, they're not tangible, but like we can, we can perceive somebody's mental models that they're using in a group you know, like there's a mental model that's shared by many people um, <clears throat> to do with uh, um, uh, utilization. Like people think uh, a lot of times in organizations that people need to be 100% utilized and they strive as a metric to be, to have their team members be 100% utilized, right? Well, what we know in a, in a uh, agile context is that's a horrible idea. That's, that's a sure way to, uh, to slow down the flow of value, right? You need slack. You need, just like you need slack on a highway, um, you, you don't want it at 100% capacity. You want a highway at about 65% capacity, creates the optimum amount of flow, right? So that's a mental model that people share is the belief that we should, do, we should try to get to 100% utilization. That's a cultural thing. That's a relationship thing. Okay, and then finally, this is the inner agility side, obviously, <clears throat> the leadership and mindset window. We're looking at, we're focusing on what's the level of the complexity of consciousness that leaders come from, that team members come from, that people make judgments out of, that people's mindset comes out of. Again, completely different thing. Think about how different that is than business results. They're related, but they're definitely a different tuning mechanism you have to use to see them, to perceive them, to work with them. Here we're looking at individuals, beliefs, emotions, thinking patterns, their values. Okay, so let's, let me pause a, just a second with that. Um, so those are the four perspectives. I'm gonna go on to the, to bring back in the culture codes again. Uh, does this make sense? Do you have any questions about these four perspectives? Um, thanks, Michael. I, I do recognize these different uh, perspectives. Um, I'm triggered 
by you explaining they're completely different. Um, you're literally saying they are related. Um, I would be super interested in what that relationship is and how the one impacts the other. Um, mm -hmm. ho hope you will take us through that. Um, so the thing I would say about that is that um, each quadrant perspective, it, it's it's like um, <clears throat> well, there's always something in the middle, if you will, that we're looking at. So let's say we have a team here and they're underperforming. Okay, so if we look from this quadrant, from the practices behaviors quadrant, we might look at what practices are they engaged in and are they doing them well? From a, from a leadership and mindset perspective, we might look at um, what's their um, level of consciousness in terms of uh, amber, orange, green, and teal, and, and, and how do they think? From a, from a relationship point of view, we would look at, do they like each other? Are they in conflict all the time? Um, uh, how do they treat each other? From a structure point of view, we might look at, um, are they, um, do they all report to the same manager or do they report to different managers who measure them in different ways? Each of those perspectives is gonna give us different information, right? And um, <clears throat> further, different people have a bias toward one quadrant over the others, sometimes two, but almost always one that they think is either more important. Well, several things they either think is, uh, is just their natural proclivity and, or they think it's more important and, or they think it's the only thing that really matters. So orange organizations think the only thing that really matters is external measures. They just really don't believe in, in emotions and feelings and people's mindset. They just don't. That's not how they see the world. So that becomes a problem. You know, the point here is that you, if you, you have to take all four perspectives to actually see everything, to actually have the best answer. Not that, because they all arise at the same, we say they tetra arise, meaning they're always there uh, always in any given moment. But, but it's hard to focus on everything in any given environment. So we tend to focus quadrant by quadrant, if that makes sense. Is that a useful? Yeah. Uh, yes, it, it does make sense. And it's it's good that you talk about the middle eh? and if it's about a team um, and if you're, if you're trying to improve something there and the environment is, is super complex, then it makes sense you look at all these angles. Um, but my question was more on that um, and I'm not sure if I'm right here, but that certain uh, uh, practices or organizational uh, architecture can also trigger things on the left absolutely. and probably the other yes. way around. Yes, and that absolutely. maybe if you see a yes. problem on the left, yes. it's something you can do on the right or the other absolutely. way around. So yes, I was absolutely. more looking at yes. how, how does that work? Uh, you said it well. <laughs> I'm right. gonna I'm gonna leave it for now, but and yeah, that's okay. let's let's see what what else uh, we anybody develops uh, as we keep going. Okay, so we're gonna jump now to <clears throat> how do people move from from one value code culture code to another at developmental level. So this is a um, a, a very uh, famous experiment that was originally done by a man named Jean Piaget. Um, who is a Swiss man, I believe, uh, who is the sort of the father of developmental psychology. And he actually, he, he did tremendously detailed studies on three children who happened to call him father. And um, he, he has really detailed notes on all of them. Uh, Laurent was one of uh, his children. I don't remember the other three, but, um, and one of the experiments he did was so, you see this about a three-year-old child, probably. Uh, you see this glass of uh, uh, blue liquid, yes? What you can't quite see is that the experimenter here has the same glass, or I mean, a, the, the same style glass, whatever, that had the same amount of liquid in it. And, and both of them were on the, on the table when, when the experiment started so that the child could see that they had the same amount of liquid in them because they were two identical glasses, right, at the same level. 
And then the experimenter pours the liquid into this taller uh, and thinner glass. And so if you look, so just do this experiment for yourself. If you look just with your perception, which one looks like it has more liquid, left or right? Somebody say it, will you? Right. Right. Yeah, the right looks like it has more liquid, isn't that? It looks like it to you. Uh, but does it? Probably not. <laughs> no, it, 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 of course it doesn't. It was exactly the same as this, and, and, and they, they poured it in, and, and it looks more, but it's not. And this child, notice his self-satisfied look. He knows that that's not true. He says, so, so same experiment, right? These are the two glasses. <laughs> poured it into this really thin, tall one. And he says, they're the same, which is true. <clears throat> Why? Because he has uh, the, he understands in a cognitive way that um, matter, that something called the conservation of matter, that matter is not as destroyed by doing that. And so it can't be different. They were, they started out the same, it changed shapes, they're still the same, still the same amount. So would you say that this child is resistive to conservation of matter? Would you say that? Is this child just need more education so that they can get conservation of matter? Because they're just resistive. No, well, I wouldn't. You can make your own decision. This child, you know, when when they grow up, uh, when they get, you know, uh, four or five years older, they will understand conservation of matter because that's just the way it works. People start to understand it from their experience that, that that's true. So um, we have to be careful that that a certain developmental level constrains what we can do. It's not like we are choosing that. It's, it's, it's how we see the world, how we experience the world. Okay, so if we, if we change this into, if we go past children and get up to adults, um, two fundamental uh, mindsets that I wanna contrast in the leadership and mindset quadrant, in the upper left quadrant there, are predict and plan, so predict and plan is, um, is a step beyond command and control, but it's where we believe that we can predict the future and we need to create a plan and then we need to manage to that plan. How many people have ever seen that in their company? Okay, good. Now that's in contrast to a different kind of approach, which is called sense and respond. So, so uh, actually, let me go back for a second. So uh, predict and plan, you see the mechanisms there, is appropriate to a complicated world. If the world is merely complicated, predict and plan works pretty well. Is your world merely complicated? I think not. In a, in, a, in, a, in a rainforest world, rather than a mechanism world, things are full of complexity. And so we don't know when we do, when, when we, if we introduced uh, a certain species of um, uh, plant here, we don't know what it's gonna do to the environment. It might do nothing. It might choke out uh, a whole uh, habitat uh, uh, for certain animals. It might create new ones for other animals or plants. So sense and respond is a different kind of management paradigm. And it, maybe you can see that it's more consistent with a complex world. It's a higher level of consciousness because it doesn't try to oversimplify the world. It knows that we have to sense um, what's going on and then we have to make a choice about uh, what to do. So if we look at that in terms of uh, our situation, so on the, on the right, I'm, con, um, I'm con contrasting the complexity of the world and our environment, our business environment, 
to the complexity on the left of our mind. So uh, this is VUCA to SCSC. Anybody work in an SCSC environment organization? Um, they used to exist and they, they might still exist in some places, but they're not most of our world. And if we look at the complexity of mind, and I'm not going to explain these levels, but you, you maybe get a sense that I've, I've mapped them to the, the culture code um, levels. So uh, this is, um, uh, you know, different stages of adult development. And, and so the environment's demand on the complexity of mind is at this level, you know, a, a, in, in the VUCA range for most of us. It may not be true for you, but it is for most of us. And the, the, your current leadership consciousness threshold might be here. This is, this is also fairly typical. It might be a little further up than that, but um, it's in that range. And that difference, that gap, you see the problems that that gap causes. That gap is everything. That's the developmental challenge of where we level up, where, where we can... If the complexity of our mind does not match the complexity of the environment we're in, we're going to be screwed. We're going to be a competitive disadvantage. I would refer you to mastering leadership. Okay, Michael, can, uh, can you go one slide back? Back just just one uh -huh. question. Uh -huh. I don't know uh -huh. if I, other people have this also the same. You said that uh, your current leadership is on that lower level. Um, could that not be the case for 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 because in in the transformation you don't only deal with leadership uh, you you deal with whole departments. Yes, this is this is not just the complexity level of of the the designated organizational leaders, but but of anybody you know team members whatever. It's in my experience, it's most significant what the very senior leaders uh, consciousness level is because you're never going to go over that. The organization is never going to go over that. But, but certainly everybody's uh, level makes a difference. So, so yeah, it, it, this is true for individuals in general. Is that, is that the question? Yes. Yeah. So just, just to refresh us on this, and then we're going to go into... Um, <clears throat> uh, how does evolution show up uh, at, from each perspective? So um, if we look at now, if you imagine that um, uh, uh, those four perspectives that I showed you in the circle are now a pyramid with four different faces to it. Does that visual make sense? That I, I couldn't get the real 3D uh, of it to, to haven't figured that out yet or gotten the right person to help me with that. But in, in the, um, in the uh, products and practices or, or uh, uh, practices, uh, that's actually the old name, in the um, uh, practices of behavior quadrant, remember we're focused on business results and we're focused on innovation. So in, in this orange, green, fourth and fifth level range, uh, uh, we described um, uh, Goal centric. Goal centric is when we're driven by the plan fu fundamentally. It's really the iron triangle. You know, we're driven by the, our goal for the product is, you know, schedule, scope, and budget, right? And so that creates a certain kind of um, uh, innovation or, or lack thereof. W moving up into the, the, the green range. You know, we have the idea of customer centric, which Agile fundamentally is a customer centric um, uh, philosophy of product development. And it resonates in this green and maybe upper orange range. Hopefully that makes sense. So if you're if you're if you're uh, if you're trying to install Agile in a um, in a fully orange or an orange amber organization, you're not gonna be very successful at getting to customer centric. You can talk till you're blue in the face about customer centric, they're not gonna pay any attention to you. Or they're gonna act nice in front of you and then they're gonna do something different. Perhaps some of you have experienced that. At this even higher level of systemic centric is about 
um, where we let the organization or the brand drive the innovation, not, not only the customer, but the whole, you know, all the stakeholders in the organization, marketing, uh, finance, um, customer support. There's lots of voices that could, you know, at the, at the, at the top level is uh, society centric. Imagine innovating your products because they had a positive effect on society, not just your bottom line, but like they, they were a contribution to the world in some, you know, authentic sense, not, not a manipulation from orange saying, you know, how we're going to save the planet by, by you, uh, not having us wash your sheets. You know, those are just orange organizations that just want to save money and they're playing like they're green. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. So if we go on to the architecture, the bottom right. So at this, in this uh, amber range. So again, what I'm trying to set up is that um, people in a given range are going to naturally create a given kind of structure. So people in this amber range are going to create a bureaucracy. That's what amber does. Level four does. Uh, it, it, you know, it has it functions it has hard silos you go up the chain you go across you go down in the army you don't talk to somebody else's commanding officer you don't mess with that right you talk to your chain of command in a in an orange um uh, level five uh, uh type of culture or thinking you you get into a matrix you 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 sh uh, cross the bureaucracy of stovepipes with like project management, where people dotted line report to a project manager, right? And it's a political uh, environment. It's a political decision um, how you reorganize. Orange uh, level five loves to reorganize. They reorg all the time. And they do it primarily for political. They don't usually admit that, but they do it for political or, or at least they might do it for strategic reasons in some way, but they are always balanced by the politics of it. So it's not usually a terribly rational process, but a constrained process. When I get up into the green to teal range, I'm, I'm, I'm truly looking at an adaptive market-driven organization structure as possible. So for instance, holacracy is a, is a um, did people know holacracy or sociocracy? Um, that's a, um, a, a, a tealish kind of a, a approach that when people, if people try to think about it in an orange or let alone an amber organization, they're just going to be sort this is where I wanted to stop people from doing harm. You're never, ever going to implement, um, sociocracy or holacracy in an orange organization. It just doesn't make sense. It's completely inconsistent with their values with how they see the world, with what makes sense to them, with what's important to them. And you're, you're you know, it's like um, when uh, Western countries go into Africa to try to, or the Middle East to try to impose democracy or, you know, free and fair elections or something. That's not necessarily what's going on in the culture. It's a, that's a, it's a cultural imposition because um, uh, it just doesn't understand you know, what's going on in the, uh, in that world. Okay. If we, if we shift to culture, um, uh, this is conformist driven. Maybe this will make sense. We, we, we conform here to a role expectation here. We, uh, uh, are driven by achievements, usually by, by, uh, material money achievements, typically or market share things like that. Here in green, we're people driven. We've, you know, the, the reason people move from orange to, to green is because they get tired of the rat race. They get tired of treating people as transactions rather than people. And orange tends to treat people as transactions. You know, we don't really care about customer satisfaction in orange. We care about customers buying again. Think about the distinction between that. It's not that customers are truly happy. It's that they buy again because that's what matters to us. 
and, and teal were, were purpose driven, right? Those are very different. In this leadership and mindset place, command and control is down here in this amber lower orange range and then predict and plan is right in here. And sense and respond is starting to get up to here. So when we start, when we preach to people sense and respond kind of ways of leading servant leadership, that doesn't make sense in, in culture code five in orange. It just doesn't. It's, it doesn't resonate. It doesn't make sense. It's a violation of values, actually. It makes sense to us in an agile world, but it doesn't make sense in um, those other worlds. Okay, so here's uh, like the full, just to give you a sense of um, bureaucracy, goal centric command and control of different levels. So feel how they, there, there's, a, there's an evolution out to greater complexity. So part of, part of your job as a coach is to figure out what range are you actually working in in terms of your client or your employer. And therefore, what will be appropriate? So you see how customer centric is a pretty big jump if you're, if you're an amber orange organization, for instance. And uh, final level sense and respond purpose driven is just is I mean, those are those are very consistent with agile values, but they're very inconsistent with most organizations out there. They're just not what they're about. Not yet. All righty, so I think I'll take another pause there. I'm going to go down into how agile specifically uh, varies by culture, but um, let me just stop to share actually for a minute and um, let us see each other. Uh, what questions do you have so far? Or no, comments? there are no other questions, but maybe people have questions now. There are none in the chat. Okay, cool, thanks. You can maybe just raise questions. Uh, yes. <laughs> Like this one. Um, yeah. In in the last slide you were just uh, uh, showing, you also mentioned uh, the part on bureaucracy, mm -hmm. um, and and you're you're linking it also to the, to these different uh, uh, colors and stages. Um, but especially the part on bureaucracy, I, I consider it to be something that that you st you'll still find in even through different levels. Eh? Um, as not everybody in the organization moves at the at the at the same time. So, yes, I'm I'm not referring to necessarily the level of the individuals. I'm referring to the level that manifests. So so organizations, in my experience, uh, are um, sort of like individuals in the sense that they usually live between two. Um, sometimes they're centered in one and, and clearly not everybody in the organization is, but if you, you know, I, I like to say when push comes to shove, what do people do? And, um, most people are in, and I'll, I'm going to go through this a little bit later, uh, amber orange between those two or pure orange or orange green or green and occasionally green teal. But, but they're, they tend to express themselves, again, not every, you know, there's always going to be pockets of people functioning at a higher level of consciousness, um, but that's not what the organization does in general. And so when you introduce something that, that uh, can evoke cultural antibodies, right, like introducing green practices into an orange organization is going to produce cultural antibodies. They're going to say, what are you wasting your time for with all that consensus stuff and you know, all that yada yada. Well, as long as you deliver, as long as you give it to me faster and uh, uh, customers like it, okay, I'll, I'll let you do your little agile, schmagile thing. Recognize it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> me too. <laughs> I also recognize it. <laughs> Lysak, were you going to come in before? No, go ahead, sir. No, go ahead. Uh, Mike, so your, your message so far, if I understand you well, is check the development level of your organization and don't push too hard 
because you will be counterproductive. You will do more harm than, than, than good if you push yes. too hard. Yes. Yes, you can. So it's, I, I, I certainly don't, mm, I would be cautious on the other hand about being too cautious or, you know, or making an assumption that they're not going to do a certain thing. I like to send out probes. I like to, you know, even, even just bringing up the concept of sociocracy or something like that, or introducing a practice from a, what I suspect is a higher level and to see how it lands not to convince them that that's the right thing. That's almost always a loser. Um, but, but more to just see how they react because people that are, when they're not ready for a certain thing, they won't even hear you. <laughs> they have no idea what you just said, <laughs> right? And, and other times when you float an idea, it, it like tweaks something in somebody or, and maybe not even right now, maybe, maybe you know, it's a week later, they bring it up to you again. You know, I've been thinking about that thing you said. Oh, okay, good. If I can come from a neutrality of I'm there to serve what they need, not what I think they need or, or what I think they should have, but what they actually need, which is not necessarily the same as what they want, right? But, but um, we, we, we usually go right to I know what they need and they're too stupid to see it or they just need convincing or I just need to make better arguments. And that's just usually not true in my experience question there Michael uh, can you maybe um, give more of an example for um, you said for example many of us or maybe I speak for myself but but many of us are still in, uh, in, in matrix organizations but even in matrix organizations especially leadership is also full of customer centricity uh, and, and in your framework that's on a higher level uh, so they speak of, of, on, on customer centricity, but you see in, in, in the other ways they act that um, it's not really customer centric and it, that's also consistent maybe with your model. But if I then try to probe a little bit, move towards customer centricity, maybe that's not the right path because they already think they, they want to move that way. So can you maybe share a little bit on... on how you would handle such a situation? Well, so first, first, let me say that uh, so um, being customer centric, you could do that in an in a level five orange way, and you could do it in a level six green way, right? So customer centric in an orange way might look like um, we constantly ask the customer for feedback, and you know whether they're satisfied or not, and we. Um, you know, like to hear from them and we, you know, uh, to even talk to them perhaps, but we don't, we don't actually make our business decisions. We don't, we don't put them in charge of our business decisions. You know, customer centric in green would be um, like what the Agile Manifesto says, which is um, uh, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Orange doesn't actually believe that. And you can see that they don't believe that. They might, they, everybody talks customers. I mean, that's just, you know, cur that's just current, right? That, you know, that's bullshit sometimes, right? And so, so, so it's that kind of distinction first is are they really customer centric or are they acting in a more orange or even amber way of being customer centric by talking about the customer a lot? So that's-, that's And, and not first. really talking and connecting with the customer. Exactly, yes. And, and, and you can feel when that's different, right? And, um, you know, I mean, in, in, I mean, asking people powerful questions in that regard or, or probing um, uh, is, is always good. And, you know, people grow by us challenging them from the level above, not two levels above, and, and, and not from a dictatorial point of view, but from an embracing, you know, warm, supportive point of view, you know, with challenge. But um, does that address the issue? Yeah. Great. Yes. I, I ran away from the amber, even red companies because it, it really didn't fit anymore. 
but now as an agile coach, I'm doing transformations and mm. the more transformations I do, the more I understand you can't change anything in those right. uh, organizations. You just right. can support some teams, some people, you can yeah. bring them some comfort by understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah. now, but my personal purpose is to, to, to bring other collaboration models and organizations yeah. To, yeah. to really work on sociocracy or accuracy. Yeah. And then my question is, how can I find the leaders that are at the level of deal right. and that are ready to be supported right. and right. that are looking for different ways of collaboration? Yeah. Yeah. But then I'm trying to find out how can you find them? Can you do some yeah, systemic uh, interviews or yeah. how yeah. could I know before I start this is not a place I have to be because it's often right. after three months, one month, sometimes I already know, yeah, no, right, this right. is nothing for me, but then you can't right. run away. I yeah. can't always <laughs> keep running away. So I, I really want to find a solution. <laughs> well, hmm. that's, a, that's a, a, a hard one to, especially to encapsulate. Um, and we'd have to get down to a lot more detail of, cir of circumstances, but a couple things I would say. One is, um, <clears throat> uh, do you know what the concept of systems entry is? You heard that term? Systems entry. Systems entry. It's what, yeah. in, in, in organization development, when you do a change project, you the first phase is called systems entry, where you're entering the system, right? and where yeah. you're doing some level of an assessment and where you, you end it with, with contracting with them, not, not necessarily legal contracting, but with creating a social contract about what you're going to do, what they're going to do, who's got what responsibility, what's possible, what's the change focus and so forth. Usually at, we teach enterprise coaches to do that. We teach them a pretty full process for doing that, but most people don't understand they might intuitively understand it but they often don't go through a formal set of practices around it um you have to do that yeah because yeah it, it, that's it's right how you it's how you screen out exactly what you're talking about yeah. you you identify and the other thing is Coaching i like to say right yeah it all shows up from the very beginning yeah so, so it, it's almost always in the room the very first time you have contact with them certainly within a couple of times it's there. The issues it's are there. there. Yeah. The, the, the leader cancels with you three times because yeah. they're too busy, <laughs> right? Or, or uh, you know, or the right person doesn't show up and somebody else does. <laughs> or, or they say, oh, yeah, sir, that, okay, that's interesting. But, you know, uh, so why don't you give us your playbook on when this is going to be done? And you yeah. go, ah, I have, a, I have a thing called the, the Dow of Systems Entry, which is a little uh, uh, a re kind of piece about... Um, you know, you have to understand their why, you have to understand who, you have to understand who the real client is, because that's never who, who presents themselves immediately. And it's never an individual. And for me, in my experience, and in, in my philosophy, um, and you, you, you uh, if, if those things don't line up, you need to leave. Yep. I mean, that's right. That's, you know, I mean, some of my best work has been done in, in systems entry and in not getting a contract. Some of my yeah. most powerful work for clients has been that. Sadly, I didn't get paid for it, but but I helped them. Yeah. I helped the them coaching. be clear on what they really yeah. wanted. Yeah. What we call a coaching agreement is uh, what I need. Indeed. Yes. Thank you. Thank yes. you very and, much. And uh, 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 Peter Block, if you don't know about flawless consulting, every enterprise coach has got to read that book it's a, it's it's the bible of organization development interventions and he has a, a couple chapters on contracting which are not legal stuff they're about you know identifying the wants and needs of the coach and and uh, of the client and how can you repeat really yeah it's called uh, peter block b-l-o-c-k and it's called flawless consulting Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question. Okay, you ready to get back into it? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I, uh, I have, still have a question, okay. Michael. Sorry. Oh, oh yeah, sure, sure. Go um, um, what I really find interesting about the contracting part is that when you enter and you are sitting there with the ones that want to talk to you, then um, I have looked from it from a, a, syst a systemic perspective, the system thinking perspective. So I see one part of the system, and yeah. usually the problem is not there, but right. it's created somewhere else. Right. But then it's really hard to detect that in an early stage. So yeah. you really need to step in and make sure that you can get grip on that right. uh, topic uh, to, to dig deeper and uh, make connections on, on another level. So yeah. I think it also has to do something with the skill set of the coaches sure, that sure, you sure. are not sure. only coach mentor, but also a consultant and advisor. And yeah. then there you are more uh, moving towards the advising uh, capabilities than the coach capabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I yeah, think right. that's Coaching something sense, where we, yeah. we need to discuss more that it that also has value. And um, when sure. people are asking you as an and inviting you as to come over as an agile coach, that if you present yourself as an agile coach, you already shut the door a bit because then you're not allowed anymore to step in the other roles. In, into being an advisor or a yeah, to be yeah. Oh, the, the, yeah. Not, for, not from my point of view, not in my competency okay. model. I no. mean, I mean, do you, do you know the agile coaching competency model, the, the X-wing diagram? Yeah. I mean, it specifically yeah. has mentoring, which could also be called advising, you know, yeah. so training and advising on one side and coaching and facilitating on the other side and a, and a, a, a mix of you, you choose those. The, the, the maturity of an agile coach is their ability to flexibly choose which one makes sense in any given situation, not to just do coaching. That's yeah. a really you know, that, that's a beginner coach move, honestly, is, is that, I, that I think I have to only ask questions or, or whatever. That's to not understand how this works. No, but I think that there is some inflation about the agile coach role where you look in, yeah, in, the, in, the, in the world now. Absolutely, absolutely. Totally, yeah, that's, yeah that, that's what I'm- That makes it more complicated it. for the ones <laughs> that are able to do it. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, Plenty of people still don't understand what an agile coach is supposed to do or what. Um, <clears throat> Did that uh, address your question? M Mignon, is that a Yeah, Mignon. Yes. Mignon. Yes, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Michael, can I ask one more question on the on the on the levels? Sure. Um, uh, a bit also from the ING practice of every day. W one of the things I find very striking is the, the the need of people in the organization, if we talk about agile agility way of working, is that is the is the focus on one. So everybody needs to do the same. Even if it's working agile, everybody has to do it. Yeah? Um, maybe other people also recognize that. Um, so if we talk about the the levels, it, it also seems a bit like a like a growth model, right? So yes. level six is better than five, seven better than, than six. I, I, I don't know if I would say better, but able to handle more complexity, yes. All right. So then my question would be, what's, what's a better place to be for an organization? Everyone in five or half in five and half in six? Well, I mean, there's going to be, if if it, if it's five and six, it's going to be better able to handle complexity because that's a little bit higher level. But it might have a lot of tension in it from people at orange and people at green, right? Exactly. Like like in a, in a political context, I, I'm afraid I don't know European politics uh, very well. But in, if it's there, you've, right? You've probably, you've probably heard of the of U.S. politics uh, since we're so loudmouthed. Um, so uh, uh, Democrats. Are, are level six green fundamentally. And, and Republicans are either level four, amber or level five. And there's some Democrats that are level five uh, too, um, but that creates the culture war. So in, in society, amber um, and orange and green hate each other. And they think, they think the other guys are you know, screwed up. 
And so if you have, if you translate that into not in a political environment, but into an organizational environment, mm -hmm. you know, half the people think, you know, it's serious business and we've got to have measures for all this stuff. And the other half think, you know, no, we need to hear from people. We need to empower people. We need to make it a safe space, blah, blah, blah. Those people are not going to see eye to eye about business, right? So what, what's so, the better so place So greater to be? complexity, but um, uh, I don't know if I'd want to even say that. I mean, you know, they'll, uh, they'll both have certain kinds of challenges or whatever. Could, could you say that the... the the better place to be is half in five, half in six, just as an example. Huh? As, as long as you're moving towards six, that you're, that you're really in transition. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a little more complicated than that in that um, the, the people, <clears throat> agile coaches especially, always want to help organizations move up. And that's, a, that's an understandable motivation, but it's often not a useful one. The most useful thing is to help an organization, whatever level they tend to be at, to understand that and then try to make them better at that. So, for instance, at level five at Orange, uh, level five is about accountability. I mean, I mean, it's consistent with level five's values as accountability, innovation, um, uh, uh, being, you know, being promoted for your merit. So, and most organizations aren't great at all those things. So if you can help them make them better at innovation, you see, you're not fighting their values. You're going, you're going in the flow of their values. So you frame what you do in terms of how to make them better at innovation, not how to make them better at uh, empowerment or values-based whatever. That's a green thing. Does that make sense? It does. So, and, and that naturally, when you get better at orange, it naturally leads you to green if the environment demands it. I mean, if the environment doesn't demand it, there's no reason to move. But you, but the environment, the VUCA environment that we work in, it, you know, we're, we're in it. The world is teal. The world is second tier, right? But but we don't meet it that way, and therefore we're not always happy. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. <laughs> sure, you're welcome. Okay, uh, going back to the slides, um, <clears throat> let's see, we're about 50 minutes in. Yeah, we're doing pretty well. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so I've already covered this. Uh, okay, so, so um, Agile adapts itself so we're going to look at the Agile Manifesto from the point of view of each of these culture codes, okay? So, uh, and uh, sorry that this is sort of backwards. The amber should be at the bottom, but <clears throat> the way I did this originally many years ago, um, <clears throat> and I've just resurrected these slides. So I call this tradition-driven at amber, results-driven at orange, people-driven at green, and adaptive uh, at teal. So uh, a level four culture likes detailed processes, doesn't like the manifesto. They, they will, I mean, if they're ordered to memorize it, they will, because that's what you do in an amber environment, but they don't like it. It totally does not resonate with their values. It just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Um, it's going to be agile in name only. Um, you might be able to do iterative. We'll talk about that. And and so and look at look at the manifesto alignment. They prefer comprehensive documentation over working software and following a plan over responding to change and process and tools. That's consistent with their values. So when we try to argue with them out of that, it's a losing proposition. And, and just discussing those things with them is where we get a diagnosis, where we get to find out who are they. You know, let's, let's don't make an assumption ahead of time that they're at a certain level, let's find out from. So then, so if we go to results driven, you remember I said contract negotiation over customer collaboration. You know, Orange will say, you'll hear things like, we are running a business here. 
you know, that's not something that green would say. It's something that orange would say. Now, orange does like working software over comprehensive documentation. Why? Because customers pay for working software. They don't pay for comprehensive documentation. So it, it aligns with their values in that sense. So does technical excellence. So the technical excellence thread in Agile finds a, a home in, in a level five in, a, in orange. So people driven, now we're talking. Individuals and interactions over process and tools. Bingo, yes, we like that. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. You betcha. That's who, who we are. Oops, sorry. Sometimes the old cursor doesn't work very well with Zoom and you can't move the window. So, so you know, green focuses on people and values and it really values the team empowerment and, and being consensus driven. Uh, flat organizations. You see how that's really consistent with agile values. Would you agree? Agile is fundamentally a, a, a code six pluralistic green uh, idea. Um, it, it's also got some teal in it, but it's really more pluralistic green. And here in adaptive and teal, uh, responding to change over following a plan is really consistent with how they believe, how they value things. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at a little bit <clears throat> in more detail. So um, I'm trying to give you some realistic scenarios here. So uh, I'm not going to address a pure level four organization because I, I don't think that there's any point in trying to implement Agile in a level four organization. It's co too inconsistent with their values. It's too, doesn't make sense to them. And so you're not gonna be successful. You're gonna, you could get paid, I guess you could bill for a while, um, but you're not gonna help them in my opinion. So if we, if we look at uh, just uh, each little level, so in a level four or five uh, organization, you really could do iterative development. And iterative development is not fully to agile, but it's a hell of a lot better than not iterative development. So that's something that you could get them to do realistically. You could start talking about customer feedback, at least in a sort of an instrumental way. If we look at the architecture place, the matrix org structure focuses on projects over functions. So at, at, at Orange, at level five, you're going to fully have a matrix, typically. At, at, in, a, in transition, you might or might not, but, but, there's, but there's at least a ground that can support, you know, the benefit to a matrix is that it's focused on, on what customers care about, which are projects, typically, you know, or product development. Hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> um, over here uh, in... Um, the, in, in, in level four, I'm going to get power because of my job title, right? And when I, in, in level four or five, I can move into, uh, mature into an outcome orientation more than the power of my, you know, so, so me getting results is going to be more valued. And I can start to, I can, as an agile coach, I could work on that. Um, the culture begins to value results. See, in Amber, the, 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 the culture values conformity. It values you following the rules. You get rewarded for following the rules. In, in orange, you know, you want results. Okay, does this make sense? I'll go through all these, I think, and, and then uh, pause for more questions. Um, so, uh, uh, in a level five enterprise, in a, in a purely orange, you can limit whip. And you do that to drive efficiency. That's the language that orange and the values that orange. You can, you can accentuate technical practices because orange, you know, loves a good resume builder. So, so you uh, introducing technical practices, training people in technical practices, mentoring them and so forth. Would, would tend to be uh, accepted, that that would work well. 
Um, it, collaboration is going to be driven by the efficiency play of it, not by the relationship play of it. So you don't use the language of consensus and, you know, making people feel good or whatever. That's not going to resonate in, a, in an orange culture. Um, the matrix structure uh, can start to get overlaid by, a, by value stream orientation. You can start to introduce the idea of value streams here because they can see they're not going to reorganize around value streams. So don't even think about it in orange. You know, that's a big tension, I think, in SAFE is that SAFE wants value stream uh, organization. And that's just, Orange is just not ready for that because, you know, it's all about power of the vice presidents that, you know, control those, um, uh, you know, whatever. And and because that's how, that's the language of Orange, right? Um, over here, uh, people like new ideas and they like success. So introducing a new thing, people in Orange like Agile because it's the latest thing. They don't like it because it's customer centric, honestly. They like it because it's the latest thing. Um, <clears throat> uh, the culture starts to value innovation and, and meritocracy, and those are both good things from a natural point of view. Um, <clears throat> okay, so if we move up to a level five, level six uh, organization, we can we can really get to more fully practice Scrum, and you can. You can usually collaborate with a wider uh, berth of uh, um, uh, people. You, you, you start value streams start to come online because we're more sensitive to the customer and the fact that you know the lean idea of what produces customer value. I mean, you know, value streams are a very lean idea. Where where is the you know concept of cash um, cycle? Not where it's all the darn functions that that who cares about those, right? At this point, <clears throat> um, EQ, emotional intelligence, comes more online in this kind of place, and and you can start to see others' perspectives. So you can start to do more consciousness work that creates that kind of a space, um, uh, and we start to value the relationship aspects of agile. You know, you can you can get a little more traction, and, and so again, that you see how diagnostic this is. You try a thing, you know, that you do as an agile coach, talking about consensus, maybe you're talking about hearing each other's points of view or something, and you see how the culture reacts. So rather than thinking, oh, they're just, you know, they're just backwards or they're, you know, they need to be fixed, you take that as information. Oh, that's interesting. They're not ready for that yet. That doesn't make sense to them yet. Now they're going to have limitations. And you can help them see those limitations. But um, so in a level six, uh, when, we're, when we really get into green, um, you know, I can really practice self-organized scrum. Truly possible. The, the structure starts to flatten, or, or at least there's sympathy for the idea of flattened structure. And, and there's no reason to not align the value streams with the org structure. It, it, that makes sense to them, though they may have a legacy problem, of course, because the um, the IT functions or the system functions are not organized by value stream originally. There may be more stovepipes, and so you can you can have some code conflict with that. But uh, at least it's 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 more makes sense to them. Um, they start to become aware of systems and work with diversity, right? Um, they, they actually value empowered teams. Um, <clears throat> green is, is values-based, whereas teal is purpose-based. And then finally, uh, a level six, seven, you know, which is probably as high as you're likely to find, um, <clears throat> truly adaptive processes are possible here. An adaptive work structure. See how, you know, trying to bring in an adaptive work structure in level five is just, it's not kind. It's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's sort of me doing it as a probe to find out what's true. Great. That's a good idea. Uh, trying to insist on it. Not a good idea. Um, 
we, we start to become aware of our own ego needs and shadow, you know, our, our repressed um, uh, feelings about ourselves or, uh, you know, um, you know, we can leverage cult cultural differences in this kind of organization. And we truly get turned on by fulfillment. All right. Michael, so um, looking yeah. at the time, I, I see it's, uh -huh. uh, it's already four past uh, uh, the time we've planned. Um, I'm not sure how the participants are, are, are feeling. Um, I am maybe now time for, for a round of questions, Q&A. Yeah, if, if uh, people need to leave, uh, please feel free to do so. And I'm, I'm happy to stay here for another 15, 20 minutes, whatever you like in terms of questions mm. or other comments. Uh, Michael, I have a question um, that's more related to uh, um, cultural awareness and also the cultural background. For instance, if you uh, work in a company where there's a complete shift of board members, executives, mm -hmm. and they all come from really different backgrounds and also yeah. really other style of leading right. companies. Right. What what kind of impact do you see uh, in these days? What's happening in those companies? When, when, when the board changes? Yeah, the board changes. Yeah. Right. And they have Hypothetical their own. Question, eh? Hypothetical yeah. question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> huh. And the name of that company would be GNI? <laughs> Backwards? <laughs> Yeah, but it's uh, yeah. I find it really interesting to notice that because they also have experiences. And what you mentioned, there are companies that are not less mature in the agile uh, way of working right. and mindset right. and growing right. towards another level. Yeah. Um, but what is the impact of that uh, when they bring that into well, a new company? In the company they are now yeah. are entering, right. that's already busy trying to yeah. go to the green zone and um, right. yeah. Right. Well, the um, the first thing I would say about that, and I might <coughs> excuse me, have multiple things to say, but the first thing I would point you to is uh, Lalu's, uh, Frederick Lalu's results, um, you know, about uh, downshifting, essentially, we call it. So um, he, he studied specifically organizations that were manifesting at Teal that, that had nothing to do with Agile, by the way. You know, I asked him this question. They had nothing to do with Agile. They weren't implementing Agile. They just were Agile in, in the sense that we mean it. Um, and uh, when when the board, well, the board and the, the CEO were the constraint on the consciousness of the company altogether. So occasionally, you know, a company or parts of a company could go up above the level of the leaders, but not for long. It wasn't sustainable. So, so the board and the CEO could, could create the constraint on the organization. So my approach to when, when I um, work in companies, um, my uh, first warning to people is if you're, if you're wanting to, to see a transformation in your company, then you have to be willing to, to look in the mirror. If you're the, if you're the CEO, you have to be willing to look in the mirror and say, I'm the first problem. It couldn't be otherwise. It couldn't be otherwise because, because my consciousness constrains everything else. So I have to expand who I am in order for the rest of the organization to expand. And leaders that don't get that, you're not going to be successful with them. And my, I mean, it is, it's, I, I, won't, I won't work with organizations like that anymore. I mean, I, I've uh, done this enough to go, that's just stupid. You know, I'm, it's going to, um, you know, it's, it's similar to, uh, you know, the old saying about teaching a pig to sing. Never <laughs> teach a pig to sing if you don't know this. Uh, you will uh, uh, um, waste your time and annoy the pig. So um, <clears throat> that's the first thing I have to say about it. Now, uh, 
just having different backgrounds on a board, you know, from all kinds of different places is not necessarily a problem. That could be great. It totally depends, right? I mean, that would be a facilitation and a, a team development kind of an issue. Uh, it depends on what level of consciousness they're coming from, how you can facilitate and help them, um, you know, be realistic about where the organization is, you know, get get their best from them. But <clears throat> Lalu did find uh, that a number of organizations that were operating at Teal at one point regressed when the board changed or when a, the chief executive changed or something like that. They would they would move down back to Orange usually because <clears throat> the, the center of gravity for business in the West at least is is Orange. That's what that's the language of business. That's what people think of as business. That's not true. I mean, <clears throat> um, Orange organizations are, will be dismantled more and more rapidly by teal organizations. I mean, just like, you know, <clears throat> uh, Uber, not that Uber was a teal organization, but I mean, it had a really defective culture, but but Uber had a teal business model. <clears throat> and, you know, they dismantled the taxi cab industry, um, you know, because it just wasn't a match. And, and that's the same finding that Claire Graves got with studying these individuals is that the people that were at the teal he didn't call it that, but at the teal level, outperformed the the amber and orange and green combined. They were they were just much better because they because you know they could argue without it being personal. So they they would have you know teal particularly um, people, and they didn't even know they were in a teal group, but they were right. He organized them into groups by level, and um, <clears throat> they loved to argue, but they didn't put each other down. <clears throat> they didn't, you know, in orange, you, you argue to tear somebody off the top. You want to be, you, it's like king of the hill. You want to be at the top. In orange, that's the value system. In teal, you don't do that. You, you, you want to express yourself, but you don't want to do it at the expense of other people. So they had really good debates on things without, you know, it being toxic. So they have better ideas. <laughs> One thought, uh, uh, Michael, I, I was having during your talk, um, um, many coaches and books speak that um, implementing Agile in, in, in smaller, newer organizations is sometimes easier than in the, the sure. bigger uh, corporates. Yes. Um, can I draw a very... Um, quick conclusion there that that smaller and newer organizations are probably somewhat more in the higher levels uh, of altitude that you 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 discussed mm -hmm. than the big corporates um, because if i look to to your picture what you're saying is that many of the 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 agile practices we actually as coaches want to implement are only partly feasible um, in, 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 in orange, uh, let's say, uh, um, amber organizations. So I don't think, so I, I think I agree with the general premise of where you're going, but I wouldn't say that, <clears throat> um, smaller, newer organizations are necessarily no, that's at true. a higher <laughs> level. But 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 I, I would say, I've been saying this for years, um, if you want to work in a teal organization, it's simple. Start it yourself. I mean, and, you know, and, and the people on this call are the ones that you, you'd partner with. Big companies are never going to become teal. I mean, I mean, of course, the exception proves the rule. So, so could somebody? Of course, they could. Will most of them? Absolutely not. Not a chance. So but that's know, a good I, one, Mike. We're, um, I think a lot of the examples that we talk about, um, they they were they were not these these big old school corporate organizations. They were either born agile or they're way smaller. Um, so, and maybe that goes all the way back to where we started this uh, uh, this evening. Is it, can it actually be done? Well, can you transform these big old school companies to 
to Teal or to <laughs> make them be more successful great. in the Vuga I, I, I don't. I don't think you can move them up to. Um, you, I, I think it's very conceivable to help an organization move up a half a level, let's say, from from five six to six, or from five to five six. That that's very you know, conceivable goal. Moving an orange organization to teal, not in, not in my lifetime. I, I mean, I, again, it's not that it's inconceivable. That's of course too strong. But is it a good bet? No, it's a terrible bet. <laughs> Now, you could certainly help an organization become better, healthier orange or better, healthier orange uh, green. So that's a ter- totally worthwhile goal. But that's not what I would call a transformation, but, but, which is fine. Um, it's more like continuous improvement, something. Uh, yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 And part of, you know, again, part of writing the book was like, Let's be honest about what a transformation is. A transformation is monumental. And stop calling what you're doing agile transformations because you're not. You're doing agile improvements, which is, you know, that agile adoptions, perhaps, agile experiments. But, but almost nobody is doing an agile transformation. Now, I, I think that there's hope with, with, uh, with smaller companies. That, and that's who I'm working with now as, as, as I, I'm, I'm really not so interested in, in uh, Fortune 1000 companies because I don't think there's much, you know, if, if I can't work with the very top of the organization, there's really not much point for me. You know, you can't, you can make incremental shift, but you can't make a fundamental shift. That, that would be my, my other question. We spend a lot of time talking about senior management in the organization and, and at least I was perceiving it like that, that leadership being a uh, top management in a uh, in this organization. Is it is it fair to 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 spend so much time on these people? Uh, and and is there other ways of doing it? Can you can you actually get to to real transformation even without um, real seniors buying into it? <clears throat> well, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? If you're if you're just trying to uh, do some agile adoption and get incrementally better, not necessarily. You could you could just have uh, their acquiescence to it, right? Them not interfering in it, and and maybe funding it or something. If you're trying to get from trans, if you actually want a transformation, you have to involve senior leadership. You have to involve the very the very highest level of the organization that you're trying to change. That could just be a business unit. It might not be the CEO. It might be the general manager of a business unit, right? <clears throat> um, but you have to have the top because, because that's who shapes the consciousness of that, of that organization. Maybe one or two other questions. I should probably end. I want to know about the heart around your neck, but maybe that's the last one to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me I'm the only one who wants to know. No, no, no I also zoomed yeah, in yeah. a bit. Even I noticed that. That is something new. <laughs> <laughs> I'm experimenting with different uh, uh, necklaces. It's going to interesting. Michael, is there anything to do with some energy sciences? With, with what? With some kind of energy sciences, energy field. Oh, um, not not directly, but in, in a manner of speaking, sure, absolutely. <clears throat> From a certain point of view, yes. Playing with different energies. So, but tell us a bit more what's in there. It's, I mean, it's a hard, there's something in the middle. I can't really see what it is. I don't, I don't know. <clears throat> Maybe. I can't see. Yeah, I think it's a tree. It's a tree, right? I have I have another tree of life that has different color stones that represent the chakras. To to uh, Tim Moy's point, keep that one for our next session. <laughs> <clears throat> Any other burning questions? No. 
Thank you. Thank you, Michael, so much for, for, yeah. for giving this talk. Uh, thank you all for, for joining um, and, uh, and choosing Michael uh, over uh, the football match uh, <laughs> Germany-France, <laughs> over the, the nice barbecue weather uh, outside. So thank you all for joining. Um, uh, I'm going to place uh, somewhere the coming weeks uh, this video on our YouTube channel. Um, that's it, I think, for the activities. Um, I'm looking now also a little bit to, to Frederick. Um, I think that that will be probably the last activity we have before the summer. But we uh, are, as Agile Consortium, already planning uh, a number of events uh, after the summer. So uh, look at our website, uh, look, uh, look uh, to us at uh, LinkedIn and uh, maybe see you in, an, uh, in another session. Thank, thank you, you, thank you for organizing for, it. For yeah, hosting this, Rene. Amazing. You're welcome. Thank you all for coming and uh, having a good conversation. I was I enjoyed it. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.